As we close out yet another difficult year, I believe it's important to remember the few bright spots that were within it. And as silly as it sounds, that can include video games. And to celebrate that, these are the top 10 games of 2021. Sometimes I just need something to relax with. And considering a sequel has been in demand for, what, over two decades? New Pokemon Snap perfectly fills that need. This year was perfect for wanting to sit back, have no stakes, and just take pictures of adorable Pokemon for hours on end. It helps that it includes some of my personal favorites. Caterpie, Snom. New Pokemon Snap had the daunting task of following up a Nintendo 64 favorite, which it miraculously succeeded at. Thankfully, there was way more to the game than the original. More Pokemon, more areas, more challenges and goals. The free DLC update to add even more than that makes it even beefier than I could ever hope for. By no means a revolutionary game, but something familiar, cozy, and comfortable is exactly what I needed this year. Just when you think people are sick of survival crafting games, a breakthrough case goes practically viral. The Viking-inspired Valheim looks much like a typical sandbox game we've all seen dozens of times before. But after a couple of hours, its uniqueness begins to shine through. Simple yet engaging combat, fantastic exploration in a procedurally generated world, and easily my favorite, the building system. You're able to create surprisingly intricate buildings, and it is representative of how much improvement you've made as you play the game. Add on the sea travel, gardening, weapon crafting, and probably my favorite food system I've seen in a survival game. And then the monsters attack. Ask anyone about the first time they encountered a troll stomping around in the forest, the undead at the swamp, or any of the massive god beasts you have to slay. It's the clear sense of direction at a chill pace with engaging, exciting combat that keeps people coming back. And I'm anticipating every single major update in the months to come. Making a new real-time strategy game in this day and age seems like a foolish idea. Thankfully, Age of Empires IV had over 20 years of experience to draw upon. It goes back to what people associate the franchise with, medieval warfare, with eight different civilizations to play from. Impressively, they each continued to feel unique with their own types of units and empire bonuses. The introduction of districts to improve efficiency makes it so that building placement requires additional forethought and honestly, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Taking a page from MOBAs, trees can now be used to hide your units and ambush the enemy. And advancing to the next age now provides options of how you get there, allowing you to change and adapt to your opponents or to provide even more variety every time you play. It's still fun to gather berries, herd sheep, and send masses of foot soldiers into masses of enemy foot soldiers and watch them fight. While that on its own isn't wholly innovated upon, it's still a blast to observe thanks to incredible sound design, making every single skirmish sound visceral. And with units now having special abilities you can activate, there's an incentive to micromanage these battles. I'm gonna be real, I haven't even touched the campaign mode. I enjoy just opening up a random map and having at it more than checking out the story. I hear that it's equally excellent and worth the playthrough. But that just goes to show that me playing just the instant action mode to rate it so highly means Age of Empires 4 was worth the wait. Sometimes you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to bring back a little bit about what everyone loved about the wheel in 2005. Resident Evil 8 The Village isn't terribly innovative. It takes the same first-person gameplay that was new in Resident Evil 7 and makes it a little smoother. Then sprinkle in a hefty amount of Resident Evil 4 and you got yourselves one really solid game. Bringing back gun upgrades, customizations, and a weapon shop added a lot of brevity to the horror game. It struck that balance of survival and action, with plenty of puzzles and exploration to boot. It even tried some different styles of horror, from the usual survival horror and even a little bit of psychological horror involving a terrifying baby monster. It also wrapped up a lot of plot points from Resident Evil 7 and sets itself up with a lot of future potential. This bit of experimenting without having to go too far from the formula accomplished a lot. Something in the air now smells of fear. 
You know how much I love my RPGs, and also love strategy RPGs. Wildermyth is an indie title doing just that, with tactical, environment-based combat. What makes it so fun to play is that numerous skills can be used together or infused for additional powerful effects and can turn the tide of battle. It has some of the best strategy RPG gameplay I've seen in a long time. But on top of that, Wildermyth is a story-based game. You don't play with your characters through a single journey, but rather many. You watch them grow old, become more experienced. Their scars from battle and decisions at the key points shape who they become. And then their prodigies continue their legends in the chapters to come. It makes its gameplay story-driven, as the combat is used to set up more story. I love it! This may be one of the more overlooked indie titles of the year, but anyone who loves strategy RPGs, creating your own characters, and lots of twists and turns that shape those characters, you absolutely need to play Wildermyth. Let's be real, Monster Hunter World is really tough to follow up, and to Capcom's credit, they didn't try to outdo it per se. Monster Hunter Rise is not a side game or a supplemental entry. It is its own full-fledged Monster Hunter game, and the innovations it brought may be some of the most exciting things they've done in a long time. Building off of world, Monster Hunter Rise keeps the familiar aesthetic, more open area gameplay, and faster paced combat. To make traversal even faster, you now have a faithful dog companion you can ride on whenever you need, and more importantly, a sort of zipline you can shoot out. This means it's easy to stay in the air, use it for even more special attacks, or if you're knocked away, zipline right back. This not only gets rid of downtime of traveling across the field, but it also keeps you in the action. There's less getting slapped away and rolling around on the ground for a few shameful seconds. This makes that addiction of going back to hunt a big monster, carve its bits, and make it into new weapons and armor to fight even bigger monsters more fluid, finish quicker, and keeps that cycle growing strong. And this is all on the Nintendo Switch. Easily one of the best looking games on the system, with smooth online play and nary a slowdown in sight. With the expansion coming in a few months, it'll continue to be one of the Switch's top games. And this is my absolute favorite RPG of the year. Bravely Default 2 was exactly what I hoped it to be, and it didn't try to be anything else. It's an incredibly solid RPG, with meticulous turn-based combat and tons of strategic thinking throughout. I haven't had an RPG really get me to stop, think, and plan out my moves several turns in advance in a long time. There are so many boss fights and extra hidden bosses that will really get you thinking. I could not get over how much I looked forward to so many battles and relished in figuring them out, strategizing, and then winning. Of course, this is all enhanced by the always excellent job system. I'm a sucker for any kind of RPG that does this. Changing out my party's jobs and sub-jobs to mix and match skills and abilities is excellent. It really allowed me to play how I wanted to play, which pretty much means always having a thief around to steal high-level equipment way before I'm supposed to. It has a just enough engaging story at first, and it quickly evolves into something much, much more. And honestly, shockingly dark at times. You don't have to have played any other Bravely Default games before this one. If you're in the mood for a 60 plus hour RPG, and trust me, you always are, Bravely Default 2 is exactly what you need. This is award-winning MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV, and yes, all the hype you've heard around it is true. I cannot overstate how incredibly powerful its newest expansion, Endwalker, truly is. It's also difficult to explain without going into any kind of spoilers, but I'll do my best. Essentially, Endwalker brings the final chapter to a story that began literally 10 years ago. Ever since Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, this is the culmination, the climax and denouement that some of us have been wanting for a decade of our lives. That's insane! And it pulls it all off with aplomb and the proper amount of sentiment behind every single moment. 
I know I'm not the only one who got a tear in his eyes during many incredible moments of the ending. It made it all worth it. Add to that, turns out Final Fantasy XIV is still a really goddamn good MMORPG. Smooth gameplay, meaningful progression, and just so much to do and see, it's overwhelming. Endwalker adds on top of everything that's already there. The endgame extreme trials are fantastic, the new raid has fantastic bosses, and if you're not into any of that, don't worry. There's still plenty of new fashions to acquire, new ways to decorate your house, new minigames, new crafting, new jobs to play as, and this is before the routine patches continue to add in even more things to do. The reason why people won't shut up about Final Fantasy XIV is just because it's really freaking good, and it's because of what Endwalker demonstrates best. XIV isn't just a game, it's a way of life. Inscription is the biggest surprise of the year. It is so good. I love playing card games, whether it's Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, or the occasional early 2000s era Yu-Gi-Oh! And it's like Inscription was made for players like me, because it takes a lot of card game mechanics and ideas from well-known properties and mashes them all into a singular, cohesive card game of its own. And there is so, so much more to Inscription beyond that. I wish I could tell you more, but the less you know before you play, the better. It goes beyond just a card game roguelike. You quickly realize it's more narrative-based than that, and it all becomes that much more intriguing the moment you are allowed to get up from the play table. What's this weird clock on the wall? What's this weird symbol? Why is there so much lightning outside? Why is this card talking to me? This game goes places you would not imagine. It does things to you that you would not expect. It can make you feel dread in ways that you did not think possible. It's like there are numerous games within the game. And with all the bizarre things aside, the game at its core is so good. If you like card games, if you like roguelikes, if you like deep mysteries, you need to play Inscription. Nineteen years. It has been 19 years since the last time a brand new, original 2D Metroid game was released. Fans have been waiting, clamoring, and at times outright demanding a game where Samus only runs left and right. And it doesn't suck. Nintendo had a lot to live up to. And my god, Metroid Dread does. More than anyone could ever hope for. These are some of the tightest controls of any Metroid game, or of any other 2D action game that I've ever had the pleasure of putting my hands on. Aiming, moving, aiming while moving, sliding, counterattacks, swinging, and speed boosting all work together in such perfect harmony that the controls become a perfect extension of your mind and your intent. This allows for so much exploration and experimenting with abilities to reach secrets and power-ups. Not only that, much like the Metroid games of old, Metroid Dread can not only be sequence broken, it was practically designed to be. The developers knew and encouraged players to get to areas they weren't supposed to yet, to have new weapons before they were supposed to. Even in my first playthrough, it turns out I did an accidental sequence break without even knowing it. But my favorite part of Metroid Dread was each and every single boss fight. These are some of the best boss fights I've ever seen. Each one pumped a lot of adrenaline with unique patterns and mechanics that required quick reactions and learning. However, it's when you realize that there are tricks, secret attacks that make the boss fights even easier that you really get that euphoric feeling of being smarter than the game itself. I made sure to get 100% items. And as soon as I did, I was ready to play through it all again. It's rare for any game to invoke an enthusiasm into me to want to play anything a second time through. I am so willing to give a second, third, fourth, or more playthroughs of the best game of 2021, Metroid Dread. 